This is a big one. Does your calendar demonstrate your values? Are you taking time for yourself, for your health, for your family? Your calendar is the bright neon sign for your values. What you say and what you fill your days, weeks, months, and years with must be aligned. And all too often, there's a sense of, huh, I know what I need to do, but I can't seem to do it. It's common sense. And you probably know all too well that common sense isn't always common practice. So it's time to think about what you value and what you can live into in, in, and, what, and how you can live into those values just, just a little more. Think about who you want to become over the next three to five years. Who do you really want to be? You know, most people take more time planning their vacation than they do planning who they want to become. And my guess is that this may very well be the very first time that you've thought about that. Most people know deep down that they are bigger than the life that they are living. And in terms of your mental health and how you impact those around you, it's time to ask yourself, who do I want to become? It's quite possible that you're feeling slightly unfulfilled in your daily life. You love helping people. It's what you got you into this profession in the first place. And yet there's an ache. There's an ache. You know that you could do more, have more, be more. You know that you've put some things on hold. Well, because someday. And that brings us back to the calendar where someday doesn't exist so what ache do you have inside? You set out on a path where you thought you'd feel fulfilled and successful by now, and you realized that there really is more. Some people dull that ache with alcohol or drugs. Others use TV. Some people work out fiendishly to prove that at least they're healthy, and others simply withdraw. If you're not feeling truly fulfilled in your life, or if you know someone who's aching to break free from their current life, you're not alone. You set your sights on a target and you work toward it. And now that you're living it, it's not as fulfilling as you thought. This <laughs> is not meant to bring you down. It's meant to put some truth in front of you <clears throat> so that you can feel empowered once more. The thing most people miss is that the journey, the journey changes you. What you thought you would feel like success when you first started out doesn't feel as fulfilling as you thought. That's the bad news. And really, again, I'm not here to bring you down. The thing is that it is true for almost 100% of the people I encounter. And I find it out because I dare to ask those kinds of questions. So the good news is twofold. First, you're not alone. You're not alone in feeling that way. And second, you have a chance to live the life you really want. And that brings us to mindset magic. I use the framework magic to help you think about how to reclaim your life in a way that's a little different from where you are now. The idea here is that when you raise your awareness, you become a leader for those around you and you serve to lift those around you. So let's explore mindset magic. Magic. The M in magic stands for mindset. Your mindset matters more than anything. It matters more than your family, your business, and dare I say, it matters even more than your connection spiritually. Here's why. If your mind isn't focused on your ability to grow and be curious and truly see and open to the possibility of, of positive opportunities in your life, you'll miss out on all of the important connections. The A in magic in the magic framework, M-A-G-I-C is for accountability. You're in a position that requires skill and comes with a good amount of pressure. And that's where your mindset will be at play here. But you also need amount accountability. You need to be accountable to your, to your patients, to your team members, and to yourself. Are you aware of what's going on for those around you? Are you aware of the thoughts and self-talk that you have during the day? Are you saying things to yourself that you'd never let anyone else say to you? This is a big concept and so easily dismissed. And in a few minutes, I'll give you my tool for interrupting negative thoughts that creep in. It's so important that you build skills that match with your values. You care about others. So can you check in with them honestly and vulnerably? 
with all transparency, I'm asking questions here because your subconscious screams the answer. When you ask a question, your subconscious wants to answer yes to everything. And so I'm asking and we'll, we'll begin to look for ways for your subconscious to say yes, if you let it. So I'll continue with a couple more questions here. Can you lead by asking for help? Yes. Whether that's for something you're struggling with or with a project you're, you're working on completing and wanting to celebrate, can you reach out to garner support? Being accountable to yourself for living into the values you said you'd have is a big deal. And the next letter in the magic mindset framework is G. M-A-G-I-C-G -G is for a, a gratitude. G is for gratitude. And there was a period of my life when I woke up before the sun came up and I grabbed something that was supposed to be breakfast before jumping into my car and heading off to work. And every morning when I'd wake up, I'd start my day by muttering some cuss words. And what we know about mindset is that what you feed yourself, you get. And one day was in one of those lovely pre-dawn cuss word starting days. I was in stop and go traffic, hating my life. Stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. And then the traffic went stop, stop. But I went stop, go. And I struck the vehicle in front of me. I rear-ended a trash truck. I didn't need a bigger sign in my life. I hit a garbage tr truck, something had to change and it did. This is a big deal here because I gave myself permission to start paying attention to the things I really did value. I gave myself permission to start to enjoy my life and to step out of a world of supposed to. And I became grateful for the things I had in my life. My morning routine shifted, and while there's a lot more to this story, suffice it to say that now I wake up happy and perky. And according to my wife, I'm annoyingly perky even before anyone's had coffee. So the first words out of my mouth with a great big smile are, thank you. Thank you. I say that out loud as I take a breath of air and stretch, I smile, and then I think about what I get to do each day. It's no longer what do I have to do, but rather whom do I get to serve and how do I serve greatly? I'm grateful each day for the difference I get to make in people's lives, and whether that's via writing or a coaching call or maybe even a smile and eye contact with the checker at the grocery store, I know I'm making a difference. And I'm grateful that I get to do that every day. Do you know what an aglet is? It's that little plastic piece at the end of a shoelace. It stops the shoe from uh, fraying, the shoelace from fraying. I bring that up because it's that little piece of plastic and I'm grateful for that. And I'd like, you to, I'd like to encourage you to take on a practice of gratitude for the really small things in your life. Think about five, 10, 20, 50 things for which you're grateful. And as an exercise, you might want to list them. It is harder than you might think. The point here again is that if you can be grateful for the little things every day, two things happen. First, you find that the little irritants of everyday life just aren't that annoying. And second, when you're grateful for the little things in your life, you find that the big things are pretty significant. And that's where true joy is born. So gratitude really is a thing. The I and the magic framework, mindset, accountability, gratitude, the I is inspiration. What inspires you? And who can you serve to inspire? I'm a big fan of lift as you lead. Lift as you lead. If you're on a path and can bring someone with you, there's no need to compete. There's enough for everyone to succeed. And the question then is, how can you help those around you? How can you serve as a role model and support or encourage others, inspiring others, lifting as you lead? You may not be aware of this, but you are being watched. Whether you're by your family or your friends or your teammates, people are watching who and how you are. Have you 
Have you ever had a really draining day and then somehow, whether at a grocery store or airport or somewhere during your day, you found yourself standing next to somebody who's in the military? Their posture is something. When my daughter was in the Marines, I'll tell you that I found myself standing a little taller around her. She probably didn't know that she was inspiring me. It's that subtle. And think about that. Your intention, your posture, your actions, your tone, and the language you use, all of those serve as tools of inspiration. Do you think you could inspire someone to be just that bit better because you're choosing to live your life just that bit better? You're choosing to step up. By the way, I use doorways as a reminder. It's called a threshold trigger. Whenever I cross over a threshold, I do a mental check. What do the people on the other side of this door need? How could I serve them? It's amazing because if you do that, every single patient gets your absolute best. And better still, when you get home, you won't feel like you left it all at the office. You'll be in a state of wanting to continue to lift others. I is for inspiration, and you can remind yourself to bring it. C is for clarity, and it comes back to your values. You've got to be super clear about what you value now, not what you did value, not what you're supposed to value. Just get really clear about what you do value. For most people, it's time and money that give them the freedom to spend with family and loved ones, maybe to enjoy new adventures. You might have a hobby or an interest you've put aside and remember that someday thing. It's not in your calendar, you have now. So what is it you value? What would you truly treasure? What would you want more of in your life? And that, that, that then begs the question about what other things you've been tolerating in your life. What have you been putting up with, whether that's clutter, a toxic relationship, or your nutrition or exercise routine, or even negative self-talk? What have you allowed in your life that no longer belongs? You might need to stop being distracted by your phone or email. You might need to become just a little more present with the people around you. Getting super clear on your values and taking even small action steps toward living into those values just a little bit more each day, that'll serve you in ways you haven't imagined. Let people see what you value through your actions and your words. Get clear for yourself so you know what's in and what's out and what you will and what we will no longer tolerate. Become really, really clear about what you value and how you stand in those values. Clarity is how you communicate what you value as well. The magic framework will serve you. This is the magic mindset. Mindset, accountability, gratitude, inspiration, and clarity. That's true magic. Now we're focusing here on mindset, which will lead us to mindfulness, and that's the foundation for great self-care, all of which are essential for mental health. Remember that health is not merely the absence of disease, Per the World Health Organization, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And we humans, we're not meant to just survive. Animals in the forest were meant to survive. Squirrels, bears, birds, lizards, they don't wake up every day thinking, how can I live my best life today? They're going to do their squirrel, bear, bird, or lizard thing same day, Day after day, same thing, day after day. Uh, they follow the seasons, certainly. But that's what they do. We have a different level of intellect, and we have a consciousness around choice. It's when we lose sight of that that we begin to feel the world closing in on us. Depression can set in when we feel like we don't have a way out. Martin Seligman is a psychologist who became famous in the 1960s for his work on that. As we look back on his work now, his early work, it seems a little cruel. He experimented with dogs in a kennel. He'd have a dog in a space with a bench and a grid on the floor that could ad administer an electric shock. In a nutshell, his experiments were that he'd sound a buzzer, and then a couple seconds later, he'd send a current through the grid on the floor. 
And the dogs learned that when the buzzer sounded, a shock was coming. At first, they were confused, but they soon, lear soon learned that to avoid the shock, they needed to jump up on the bench. The buzzer sounded, the dog would jump on the bench. The buzzer sounded, the dog would jump on the bench. The buzzer sounded, and the dog would jump on the bench. What came next was the hard and kind of cruel part. Seligman had the bench removed. The buzzer would sound, and the dog would look around frantically, searching for the bench, and the shock would come. A buzzer would sound and the dog would run or hop looking for the bench and the shock would come. And then eventually the dogs realized that without the bench, the shock was coming. And the buzzer would sound and the dogs would just lay down. Without the sense of escape or any way out, the dogs just laid down and took it. This research is what made Seligman famous. And the concept here is what's known as learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. When we feel like there's no way out, we begin to tell ourselves stories like maybe we've done something to deserve it and maybe no alternative exists. If there doesn't seem to be a way out, maybe we'll just, we might as well take it. I think we can all think of someone in our lives at one point or other who's lived that way. They feel a little caged. They feel like there's no way out and they feel like maybe even they deserve it. And this is so anti the magic framework. It's why I introduced that first. Learned helplessness is what it says. It is a learned way to be. And luckily, by the 1980s, Seligman realized that if dogs and people could learn to live their lives from a place of helplessness, the other opposite just might be, just must be true as well. And he began doing a variety of experiments and was able to show that if you interrupt negative thought patterns, if you engage in gratitude and charity, if you look for the positive, you can train yourself to look for alternatives in your world. And with that, the world of positive psychology was born. We can learn to live our lives in a way that's meaningful, focused, and purpose-driven. We're beyond just needing to survive. As humans, if we're not thriving, we're in a state of disease. Again, you need to hear this. As humans, if we're not thriving, we're living in a state of dis-ease. Our mindset matters. The mindset of those around us matters. Our accountability to ourselves and to others is paramount. Living gratitude, living that way, it's a choice that serves to elevate. Being deliberately inspirational keeps you present and focused on others. And being clear, having that clarity about your values and your boundaries, that allows you to accept in only the things that truly matter. Thriving is your normal set point. How would your life be different if you took that concept on fully? Thriving is your normal set point. You don't have to tolerate surviving and never ever say, oh, live in the dream. When someone asks you how you're doing, you don't get points for suffering. Overall health starts with mental health and that's all about mindfulness and self-care. Listen to the words you use with yourself. Would you let someone else talk to you or your mother the way you talk to yourself? You know, if you're doing well here, pass that on. That's awesome. If you're realizing that you've been beating up on yourself, caging yourself, and maybe even teaching yourself that there's no way out, it's time to change and even reach out for help. By the way, that one tool I use to interrupt negative thoughts that try and sneak in, I say reset, reset out loud. Doubt edges up. Reset, reset. It's a handy, quick thought panel interrupt. It makes me smile. And I remind myself that just as much as there might be some doubt, 
There's also the likelihood of success. And that's what I reset to. We choose to better ourselves so that we can be better for others. We choose to lift as we lead and we step into the role of leadership, no matter the position we have at work or in our family. What stops us? What gets in the way of asking for help or even seeing someone else that might need some help? It's something that Jerome Adams, the former Surgeon General, said, said is bad. It's really bad. And in a word, that's stigma. We need to be talking about how we're doing. We need to see what's real and not judge ourselves against someone else's highlight reel on social media. And we need to be seeing each other. Your mindset has to be so attuned to possibilities that you see others who could use your unique gift, that of being a kind, present, compassionate human. Dr. Adams said that stigma kills more people than cigarettes, heroin, or any other risk factor. Why? Because stigma stops people from connecting. We need to identify stigma and talk about it in order to overcome it. There are three types of stigma. There's self-stigma, where we internalize and accept negative stereotypes, essentially taking on the notion of being broken. Therefore, maybe bad, wrong, or unworthy. There's social or public stigma, where a general negative feeling about a group exists. Those who are mentally ill or addicted are, you could fill in the blank, a result in people choosing not to access care and essentially suffering alone. And then there's structural stigma where our workplaces or organizations actually make it difficult to access care. Well, the CDA is changing that and we'll talk about resources on and after our panels. You're here to build awareness about how to build your life, living into who you deserve to be, and in doing so, giving, giving greater care of and to yourself. It's in this way that we create connections with others. What does it take to build a culture of caring? It's here that we each stop being one of the anonymous, we who believe something should be done and become an accountable I who steps in to become aware and take action where needed. Connections with others is about being deliberate and seeing them. We blow into work and get right to it, and we could pause. What does it take to say, I see you, dear human, I see you? Think about the last conversation you had with someone. What color were their eyes? It only takes two seconds or less to have eye contact. It only takes a moment of being deliberate to connect and build a culture of caring. And that starts with one. A culture of caring comes from and through your values. It's demonstrated in your actions in how you pause to connect with each other, how you listen and how you hold space for another. Sometimes a sacred second, a pause, it's all that's needed. I see you, dear human. Use the mindset magic framework for yourself. Mindset, accountability, gratitude, inspiration and clarity. Interrupt old patterns that no longer serve you and become truly deliberate in the way you choose to see others in your world. You might just save a life by creating and living into a culture of caring. I see you, dear human. I see you. That's magic. I'm Dr. Wayne Purnell. Thank you. At this time, I would like to take us to our panel. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Roberta Garceau and Dr. Matthew Korn. They'll be joining us for the next segment of our program, a panel discussion about looking inward and tools you can use to prioritize mental health and wellness. I could see Dr. Matt. All right. Uh, I can't see Dr. Garceau, but I'm pretty sure she's there. I'm going to introduce them. Dr. Roberta Garceau, not only is she a practicing dentist, she's also a wellness advocate. Roberta blends current science with traditional 
or Ayurvedic wisdom to help others enhance health, function, and self-esteem and overall well-being. Dr. Matthew Korn is a periodontist practicing in Sacramento, California, and he's a recovering addict with over 13 years of sobriety. His relationship with addiction makes him uniquely qualified as the CDA Wellness Committee Chair, and he, as he likes to say, his mess has become his ministry. As we get rolling, there's some statistics that are worthy of paying attention to. Prior to the pandemic, we saw stats showing that 25% of Americans had some form of mental health or substance use issue, 25%. That's one out of every four people. Now, the recent stati statistics are staggering as that number has doubled and now 50% or one out of every two people has experienced or is currently experiencing some form of mental health or substance use issue. Whether anxiety, depression, or something else, either we've experienced or we know someone who has. That means 100% of the population has been touched by this issue in some way. I would encourage you to build vision statements that allow your, that allow your practices to reflect a culture of caring. And as you'll hear in many ways during our time together, you, can, you can't give what you don't have. And that means you have to grow in what you know, and it means that you've got to take care of yourself so that you can actually care for others. Again, a culture of caring has to start with self-care. With that, let's jump into the panel with Drs. Roberta Garceau and Matt Korn. Matt, good to see you. Your story is one of addiction and recovery. How do you manage stress now as a recovering addict? Well, thank you for asking, Dr. P. And uh, I want to also thank the CDA for inviting me to this forum and uh, giving me the opportunity to tell a little bit of my story. Uh, the, sh the short answer to your question is much differently than I used to. Um, yes. First, first, a little bit of background. I, I grew up in what I now know was a pretty dysfunctional family, although at the time it seemed totally normal to me. And uh, But I learned how to handle stress from what I saw as a kid growing up, which meant typically you argued about things, typically you blamed other people for things. And I went off into dental school and became a dentist and uh, found eventually those things didn't work so well. So. The best way to describe the family I grew up in was it was like the Rolling Stones to Mother's Little Helper. Mom would take a little Xanax when she wasn't, you know, handling the kids all that well. And guess what? That's what uh, kids see parents do. So that's what we learned to do. So now, thankfully, in recovery, I learned that I am not my behavior. And I didn't change, need to change who I was. I only needed to change my behavior. And... So I only had to really change one thing, and that was everything. And uh, at first, that sounds like a lot. It sounds like trying to eat an elephant. But then I learned that I only needed to do it one bite at a time, and time takes care of the rest. So um, basically, uh, as a you know, as a kid, I was focused on getting drugs. High school, all the way into dental school, I wanted you know some part of my day was focused on that. And now it's it's much different. All I can say is that the process, the recovery process has taught me how to take care of myself first so that as you say, there's more of me to give to others. And that whole process of taking care of myself and helping others is the best medicine I can take on a daily basis. So, so every day I wake up every morning, this is my routine. My eyes open, I take a breath and I put my feet on the floor. And I say to myself, that's three miracles by 6 a.m. Somewhere in the morning, I'm either on Zoom or um, attending in person now because they're open again, my men's group, which is an AA meeting. And these men are my mentors. They are the people that teach me. Um, they keep an eye on me, first of all. They help me with my thinking that isn't so great all the time but they teach me that I'm an amazing human being and I can go out into my world after 6.30 a.m. 
and be, uh, be a contribution and make a contribution. So I'm also really careful about what I put into my body through my eyes and my ears, not just my mouth, because there are a lot of messages coming my way. And if I don't have a filter, I can start to take some of that on. And today I find some of the messaging to be pretty agitating. So I just turn the TV off. I do like to be entertained. So I record some things. I fast forward through the commercials, that sort of thing. And then, then I find ways to nurture myself. Like gardening is meditation for me. And uh, when I exercise, I, I love to cycle. That's, I call it cyclotherapy. I've learned that every time I exercise, my brain produces this beautiful chemical, brain-derived neurotropic factor, and it helps me create new axons and new synaptic connections. So my brain is rewiring due to the fact that I exercise. I limit caffeine. I do take some vitamin I because you guys know that is ibuprofen because, you know, I'm 61 years old now and things just don't work the way they did when I was 18. So, so that's, that's kind of my day. That's awesome. I love the, I love the notion about, um, I mean, it, it goes back to what will you tolerate? What do you tolerate in your life? Right? What do we let in? What filters do we have? That's, that's fantastic, Matt. Thank you. Roberta, um, similar question. What, uh, what techniques do you use for self-care? We've got some sound issues. Is that is it possible it's your it's your pods that have that aren't charged still? Have they gone out? I just want to double check. Is it just me that's hearing that, or Matt, are you hearing it the same way? Hearing that too, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so yeah, so Megan is giving you some. This is hey, this is live, you guys. This is what happens. So Megan uh, in the background is uh, is saying disconnect and reconnect your AirPods. Let's just see if we can get a, a connection. This is how it works. We got good people on our panel and occasional uh, tech stuff that, that just makes it uh, glitchy. It's okay. And, and Roberta's message is so important. We want to make sure that, that we can hear her. Cool. So Megan is suggesting you check your audio source. Meaning, does it show that AirPods are the ones connected? You sounded good before we went live, so I'm not sure what happened. It's nice to see you both. Let me ask Matt another question while we're doing that, okay? So, um, Matt, I know that, that battling with addiction itself, it's not easy to do alone. How did you find the courage to ask for help? That is a great question. I would love to tell you I had the courage to ask for help, but that, that wasn't my case. Um, I love what you said earlier about our inner voices and the way we hear ourselves and talk to ourselves. Uh, trust me, there were several times I wanted to ask for help, but it could never come out because that, was, that part of me was broken at the time. Um, the shame that was built up in me was too much for me to get out from underneath. So uh, my, uh, my intervention, if you will, revolved around an employee coming to a coach I was working with, and that coach did something that really mattered. Uh, most people can tell someone they have a problem. Uh, usually they get pretty angry and they say something. But what worked for me was my coach asked me if I thought I needed help. And the way it was soft and it was a question, I actually could get it out. But uh, not before the state board ended up in my office. They, they're law enforcement officers. They have guns and badges. And that was a scary 
proposition that I wouldn't want anybody to have to go through. That's yes. why I do what I do, because there's an alternative to waiting till the bitter end uh, when help comes to find you. But the bottom line is, help did come to find me. It was just the right thing for me. Thankfully, I could surrender at that point, and the rest is the miracle. So that is a miracle. Every day, every day a miracle, and with you know, we each get to start with a miracles every morning. Roberta, can you hear me now? Let's hear. Oh my goodness! Another Yay. miracle. That's awesome. The miracle <laughs> of technology. This is awesome. So, look, you know, frustrations happen. Here's let me start. Let me start back uh, with the question I had wanted to ask you, which is, what techniques you use for self care. Well, there was one that you might have just seen. I did this. <sighs> like, <sighs> like exhale, right? So, um, yes, as I was trying to say, uh, to me, self-care is a very proactive endeavor. Um, I used to think that being uh, that self-care was selfish. And so like a true martyr, I put everyone else's needs before my own. And it worked great until it didn't. And I needed emergency surgery because I had internal bleeding and my body literally imploded, right? So um, not so good. Now I ask myself the number one self-care question, which is, what do I need right now? I mean, really ask that question of yourself multiple times a day. And it requires a level of self-awareness. So hopefully through the panel and through some exercises today, uh, that will be some, some techniques that, that folks can use to tune into their own selves. Um, once you know what you need, try to find it, right, in a helpful way. So, you know, my personal self-care techniques include, you know, I wake up before the sun. I wake up usually 5.15, 5.30 in the morning so that I have time to meditate and breathe and do some yoga stretches and then journal. And so in this way, I am getting my body, my mind, and my spirit or energy, if you will, um, intentional, focused, and ready for the day, for whatever happens, right? Um, so a lot of intentionality with that. Then say it's a work day, once I'm at work, um, I do take breaks, right? Give yourself a mask break these days. Oh my goodness. Go to the bathroom, get a drink of water. You know, um, I had a patient come in recently, a young man and went into a full on panic attack. I'm like, oh my goodness. So when that happens, not only can you help your patient by breathing, but you can help yourself with mindful breathing. And I'll be leading a, a bit of an exercise and a really simple technique that we can all use a little later in the program. Um, stretch during the day, that's another self-care thing. Get up and move. Uh, if you've been sitting here for the program the whole time, you might wanna get up and just stretch right now, right? But for the viewers, um, stretch in your operatory stretch with your assistant, there you go. <laughs> stretch with your patients, um, take time for that. I do try to eat mostly organic, local, fresh foods and seasonal foods as much as possible. You know, do I eat the random donut? Of course. You know, I'm not a purist here. I live in the same world that you folks live in. But uh, as Dr. Korn said, he tries to put healthy things in, right? So I do try to eat that and drink lots of water. Lunchtime. Yes, there is a lunch break, right? Um, you cannot, stuff happens, right? But you cannot work through lunch day after day after day. I tried it, it doesn't work. <laughs> it just really doesn't work well. So make sure you have a lunch break. And even if it's 10 minutes, do not check your emails, your stocks, your social media, like eat mindfully for 10 minutes. I will sit in my office cause it's quiet and I have a window. I'll put my feet up on the windowsill and just look outside. Just like, just be with your food, just be in a moment. And then try to get some movement. Again, it's not possible. It doesn't happen every day. But even if you can get outside five, 10 minutes, walk around the block, give yourself some space to clear your head. These are all little tiny health uh, self-care techniques that you can do. They don't cost anything and they're available. 
Uh, by the evening, I like to reconnect with family or friends over a healthy meal. And then at nighttime, I do a little self-massage with oils, organic food-grade oil. Doesn't have to be fancy. you got coconut oil at your grocery store, um, sesame oil, anything like that. And just give a little self-massage. It helps with joint lubrication, helps with your skin, helps to ease your muscles right before your shower. And then I have a little herbal tea. Um, and unwind with a book or something look like a little mental gloss tea here. <laughs> so that can help to unwind at the end of the day. Um, so lots of little things. Um, and Wayne, I'm curious though, what do you see as you're working with dental leaders and how do you coach them for better mental awareness and self-care? That is a great question. I wanted to comment on a few things. Um, let me hold that for a second. Breathing is huge. Being intentional is huge. I wanted to underscore the things. I have been taking notes and I'm hoping that our audience is taking notes as well as you sit there. Mm. Uh, absorb it however you absorb this information. There are gems that are dropping right and left here. So please take it in. Breathing, being intentional, being in fo in, uh, focused. Staring out your back window is huge. I worked with an executive. One of the things he did was what he called rabbit time. He'd turn his, he'd set a timer for like three minutes. He'd turn his chair around and stare out the window at an empty field. And he called it rabbit time because he'd watch the rabbits hopping in the field. It is huge. And then um, there's research I have, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm traveling and I brought tons of, of research with me. There's even recent research as, as recent as last week that talks about the, the um, importance of getting outside and how that affects not only your mindset, but also, I mean, your whole, your whole body, your whole body. Mm -hmm. So um, it's huge. Now, when I work with leaders, I, I work with leaders across an array of organizations um, and as I noted in my speech, I always start with mindset and gratitude. I always start there, right? So, and, and uh, as you know, I guide through people through exploring five key areas of high performance. And the first one is clarity. You've got to get really clear while I end my magic mindset with the C of being clear of, of clarity. Uh, the, the first place that I start is that is there. You've got to be really clear on what you value. You've got to be able to define what's in and what's out. If you're not focused on your filter, you're going to let things in that aren't your priorities. And we all have competing priorities. And just because something is important doesn't mean it's important now, right? I mean, one of the things I talk about is like a picnic basket. You, you know, there's a... There's a, if you look around in the world, you could choose a hairdryer or a jackhammer or a bread knife. And if you're going on a picnic, most picnics are going to choose the bread knife and not the hairdryer or the jackhammer. Most picnics. I've had people tell me that occasionally a jackhammer would be helpful. <laughs> um, but really it's about, these are important items, but they're not important now. And you have to define what you're, what's really important for you. So um, what will you tolerate and what you won't and who do you want to become? And, and that is the huge, that's a huge foundation for mental health and wellness, right? So the other, the other areas uh, where I work with high performance and in my dynamic leader program is energy or vitality. Now for a couple of us across the country, it's late at night. And we could go, oh, it's late. You know, I gave, I gave so much today. And it's like, no, it's time to still be present. It's time to still be present. And when you're done with your day at the end of your workday, it's time to still be present. And that's where I use the threshold trigger that I talked about before, right? You've got to be able to manage your energy and manage, uh, manage the fuel that you give it. And that's where both, um, both Roberta, you and Matt have talked about be careful about and be mindful about what you put in your bodies. So courage is another place where I work with leaders, right? Stepping up and stepping in to do that stuff you've been putting off. And it is courage to even say, yeah, you're right. I probably could accept help. I probably might need some help. That's courage. It's a huge act. 
productivity means cramming more time in your in your day, actually more things in your day because you're managing those things. We all have 24 hours and there's always these pulls and, and distractions. So it gets back to what will you tolerate and what will you not? And so being able to be productive and focused is really important. And then getting the support you need is being able to ask for support and being able to get that support that's influence. And so those are really the the five areas, you know, asking for what you need is done without apology. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to bug you, but I could really use, it's like, no, no, it's your life. You are stepping up and stepping into being a better version of you every day. You have to, you have to, you owe it to the people around you to be that bit better every day. And, and that means you step in unapologetically sorry for being bigger. I didn't accidentally mean to lead you. You've got to choose to lead. You've got to choose to step up. And so that's uh, the really in a nutshell, I think I'm hoping uh, that that answers uh, the question about self-care. Let me, uh, let me swing back to Matt for a second. Um, what's, what do you think is important for others to know about your recovery process? You're muted. <laughs> I did it. All right. It's, it, it's so much better when we can hear your gems of wisdom. I do. Um, there, there are three things, really. First of all, uh, I'm going to answer this question by addressing people who either may be struggling with some kind of a substance uh, use issue or know somebody that is. Um, remember, I was... It turns out I was the last guy to find out I had a problem. Everybody else knew, but but couldn't step up. So here's here's the thing that I want everybody to hear. Number one, I was in a hopeless state when I was uh, under the influence and I couldn't stop. What I learned is there's hope. Uh, 85% of dentists that I know of that I've helped with in the last 13 years have, are still recovering. 100% of them have a better life, not than they had before, but a better life than they thought imaginable. Now that's, that's hope. Um, and the last thing is that addiction isn't the disease that only affected me. It affected my entire family. Heck, it started in my family of origin and it came down the generations to me. And then I shared it with my, uh, my family. Uh, every single person in my family took on an adaptive role to deal with me. So me getting help and getting healthy was the influence on the entire family that they needed to do some work. I think of my son, who's 23. He uh, went through a family program as I went through the Betty Ford Center, and he became a dear friend of the man who's a miracle, who teaches kids about addiction. They still stay in touch. He has so much recovery knowledge. I'd like to think that's sort of insurance for him in his future. There's no guarantees, of course. But what I see happen in my family, I just celebrated a, a, a alcohol-free Thanksgiving. That never happened in my family 13 years ago. So all these miracles are waiting. Uh, it's like eating the elephant. It doesn't happen all in one day. That's what I think people need to know. That's huge. Yeah, it's huge. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, again, I'm going to underscore some of the stuff you've said. The, the idea that people could live a life that was unimaginable and to really, really help them imagine. Help, <laughs> help others imagine the unimaginable. It's like, what, what would your life be, life be like if... And it's, it, it's what would your life be like if you had more time, if you had more resources, if you had more availability to yourself, what would your life be like? It's, it's huge. And then, you know, you talked about the adaptive processes of the family, and I wanted to come back to that as well, which is, you know, uh, the, the family has been likened to any, any system, whether it's family or team 
or any kind of organization, but really here we're talking about the family has been likened to a mobile, you know, those mobiles that have little, little dangly things with cross, <laughs> cross strips and they hang in balance and everything moves in balance. And if you move one item down that pole, it starts to shift and everything else around it must shift. And the adaptive process for someone who's, um, who's uh, addicted or abusive or um, otherwise disordered, the whole family unit finds a way to make it stable. And that's sometimes always moving. And that becomes very energy intensive. And so it's one of the reasons that we're having this conversation specifically. Um, with that, Roberta, you know, I, I use an acronym uh, that I picked up along the way that is, that is HALT, HALT, H-A-L-T. I use that acronym to remind me not to make any major decisions when I'm, if you, in the acronym H-A-L-T, when I'm hungry, when I'm angry, when I'm lonely, or when I'm tired, HALT. Um, on, uh, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And, and if you're listening to this and you hadn't heard that, please write it down. Um, on those days, Roberta, when you might find yourself just that bit little angry, I was gonna use another language, angry or frustrated <laughs> or overwhelmed, <laughs> What do you do? What are some of the tips that, that you might offer for how people are, are feeling that, how they might get through it? Uh, so, of course, I've never felt that way, but I've heard others have, right? Yeah. Um, anger, frustration, and overwhelm. They are the perfect trifecta for the perfect storm. Um, t those are actually two different imbalances. And so anger and frustration our excess fire. Uh, it's when we've been just working too hard, too many hours without a break, without that self care to restore ourselves. Right. And so when I find that happening to me, cause it does happen to everyone. Um, I think, okay, what do I need right now? I need to cool down. I need to cool down that fire. Right. So that might be physical, right? Take a mask break. If you're, not at the office, if you're outdoors, find some shade. Uh, in the office, I'll turn on the air conditioning, a fan, or open the window in the cool weather, just cool down. And then exhale, again, breathe, right? Exhale and drink some room temperature water. So uh, we might think, oh, I need to drink some ice water to cool down. Actually, no, your body has to work harder to warm up that ice water so that it can process it and, and it can work in your, your system. So just drink some nice room temperature water. And then I, um, if it's necessary, I give myself a timeout, right? Just if you, I need to remove myself from the situation, like if I just feel too frustrated, walk away, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom and do some mindful breathing. For the most part, no one's gonna follow you in there for two minutes, right? Go get a drink of water if it's, a bigger thing than that, and you need to walk around the block at lunchtime or something, whatever it is, that's, those are some of my, my tips to cool down. As far as overwhelm, to me, that's a separate, a separate animal. Um, overwhelm is too much movement and too much air and wind. Um, so to slow that down, we've got to slow it down, right, to reduce that. So one, I will begin and end my day with a mind dump, right? So that would look like all the things that are contributing to overwhelm, right? It could be environmental. It could be that there's too many emergencies being thrown in the schedule, or there's too much noise, or there's too much visual stimulation. You know, Matt, when you said you sometimes turn off the television for various reasons, or you turn off those commercials, if there's just too much coming at you, um, slow it down. And um, really a mind dump can be helpful with that. So it dumps out, it offers relief by releasing all the things that are in your mind on your to-do list and all the swirly, swirly monkey mind. So once I've written it down, I know, okay, I can kind of let that go. I can see it on the paper. So there's the relief. And then I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, there's some clarity to this because I, I have a better visualization of it. I see the pieces. And 
okay, now that I see it, I can prioritize things like all these to do's and maybe it's an errand or maybe it's a task. And it's like, yeah, I don't have to do that today. Or maybe I can delegate that or I can ask for help with that or it's not really important or I can, okay, I see a time later this week that that will work out better for me. So a mind dump, again, the beginning of the day to set out your intentions for the day and the end of the day to get that stuff out so you don't have what we call in yoga and Ayurveda the monkey brain, right? That monkey mind that just doesn't stop. It's like the little monkey that was, you know, doing the music machine, just going and going and going and not stopping. Um, yeah. <laughs> that too, right? We all know the monkeys. <laughs> Dr. P, you love monkeys. So um, I did allude to the other thing is breathing, right? Breathe, get some relaxing music. I do that at the office. There happens to be a channel on a subscription music station that begins with a P and it is relaxing, gentle office music. Like, okay, they have a channel for this and it's wonderful instrumental music. So if you don't subscribe to that, um, I don't know who this gentleman is, but Ryan Stewart piano music. It's, it's a nice thing. It doesn't put you to sleep, but it's nice and calm. Like look up stuff that will help you and help your patients. Um, and then lastly, as I did mention, and as Dr. P mentioned and, and Matt, um, ask for and accept help. You know, a lot of us go into dentistry because we want to be our own bosses and we're that kind of personality. We may be task or um, goal driven, but people, it's okay to ask for help and it's necessary. So asking for and accepting help is the other way to help uh, deal with the overwhelm. That's huge. Thank you. That's great. I, uh, years ago, I, some of you know, I was a martial artist and I would teach, um, self-defense and it is a common practice when you're startled to go, <gasps> right. It's like, <gasps> it's a fear response. <gasps> and, uh, with the first thing that you started with, when I asked you this question, the first thing you started with Roberto was to say, exhale. Right. And so yeah. uh, in self-defense, I taught people how to roar, like roar, roar, <laughs> uh, right? And if you roar, if you exhale fully, your body says, I must inhale, right? Exactly. And then your body goes, <gasps> but if you inhale, you could hold your breath and hold yourself in this state of tension. And that's, that's pretty horrible, right? So um, that's, exactly. that's tough stuff. Yeah, that's why when I right, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just saying that when I help patients or myself, especially when I help patients, though, I tell them first, exhale completely. So when you're trying to help your patients, squeeze the stale air out of your belly, squeeze that belly button towards your spine, because then they can breathe. Otherwise, it's like <gasps> you know, yeah. they're trying to breathe. It's like no, you breathe out first, and then your yeah. body will do the rest. Let it come in. That's so important, right? To begin listening again to your body. And the other thing you said about writing stuff down allows you to not be st spinning and putting energy into trying to track all the details and just being present for yourself. And I think that's, that's so important as well. Um, Matt, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, you know, we talked about the idea of building a culture of caring, building a, a culture through vision and through values, through expressing that, where you can actually embody that every day. And so I know that your values are so strong, they must come through in your actions. And you are building a culture of caring focus for your team and your practice. Can you talk about that? What does it look like for you? And how does that support your mental health and mental health in general, building a culture of caring? And we have all day to answer this question, correct? <laughs> this, is, this is an eight hour topic for me. Uh, so let me see if I can distill it down into about three minutes. Uh, first of all, I love people. That's just the way I'm built. Um, it wasn't always that way, but that's who I've become. 
So when people uh, interview to work in my office, the first thing I do is I do a Gallup Strengths Assessment. I've done that myself. I've known my top five strengths for over 20 years. And the minute I hear their top five strengths, I know them at a much deeper level just in the first few minutes. Uh, I also have an unlimited CE policy. The good dentists go to CE, great dentists bring their teams, exceptional dentists send their teams and stay home. So those are things that I just start with. Um, Patrick Lencioni is a great business author. I just trust everything he writes, even though it doesn't make sense. And one of those things was a trust building exercise I do on the first day of employment with every every employee. We, we get together as a team, even for just 30 minutes. And the question is, tell us about your childhood. Now that's a really scary question. So I go first and I tell the story I've already told you guys. I grew up in a crummy family. It taught me some things that didn't work for me. And by the way, I'm in recovery and I run a program for the CDA to help dentists who are struggling with substances. That gets it right out there because everybody needs to know I got two jobs. And what comes next is the miracle. Uh, if, if you're the new guy, you go last, but the people that have been there a while, I've done this several times, you should hear their stories evolve over time. It is so beautiful as they get to know themselves better over time and they're, they're trusting the team with more information incrementally every time we do it. So that's, that's a big one. I, I don't know what I'd do without that one. Uh, shifting over to patient care, I do a couple of things. I've, every new patient I say, let me tell you how much I value my team. And because I do that, I never hear a patient abuse my team. It used to happen all the time. It frustrated me. I didn't know how to stop it. Well, guess what? I only had to change me. Once again, there's that principle, change me. Uh, every new patient, I do a preclinical interview. I need to know who I'm treating. I can't uh, dehumanize them the way I used to, the way I did in dental school. I was taught that teeth needed to be fixed, so I fixed teeth. They came down conveyor lines, I fixed them, off they went. I am so connected to people now that I need to know who they are because that affects their treatment plan. Uh, rule number one, we're not gonna hurt each other. Rule number two, if we hurt each other, see rule one. Uh, those things keep me, keep me on track. And then the other thing is I wanna power share with my patients. I want them to make the decisions, not me. I can show them the menu, but only they can choose. And it's my job to help them understand the pros and cons of their choices. So uh, the way it helps me is that positive energy that infuses my team, I think is love energy. Love isn't a feeling, it's energy. And if we're giving it away, we're getting it back as well. And it also makes it real easy to figure out when fear is taking, uh, popping up and trying to take over. And from time to time, I do have to set an employee free. That's what I call it. I don't call it terminating, I don't call it firing. I set them free because this isn't the right place for them. I wish everybody could find a home there, but that's, that's unfortunately not the reality. So that's sort of a, a, a baseline for the systems I use intentionally every day. It's huge. It's huge. The number one most empowering thing that any of us have, it sets us apart. And that is choice, right? So the ability to choose, right? A, a tree grows because it, it's genetically planned to do that, right? It grows from a, 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 a little seed. We, as humans, have the ability to choose, and we're the only animal, we're the only living thing that can choose to stop. And, and it's an amazing thing when you recognize that choice is so powerful. So what you were saying about, you know, having a choice, giving a choice, empowering your patients to have a choice, I'm just, I'm underscoring and applauding that, because that is where the truth lies. And and love is where the truth lies. And we need to be having more conversations about what that looks like as we engage with each other and as humans. I, I, I love all of this conversation. This is, this is fabulous. And, and it's great to hear you 
uh, to hear you talk about it, Matt. So thank you. Um, Roberta, back to you for a second. Earlier, you had talked about your mindfulness practice and you have a background in Ayurveda that seems just sort of like this concept that's almost out of reach. So can you talk a little bit about what is Ayurveda, what does it mean, and uh, like how, how does that apply to wellness? I sure can. <laughs> um, I do hear a little reverb here. Are we okay on the sound? There's a little echo. I'm going to mute my mic and Matt, if you can. All right, that, that's better, I believe. We're good? Okay, thanks. So in Sanskrit, the word Ayurveda means life wisdom, and it's a thousands of year old tradition of Indian medicine that's still practiced today. Uh, it's also known as the sister science to yoga. So they'll, they'll hold hands a lot of times. Now, um, like other alternative forms of medicine, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, herbalism, one of the beautiful things about yoga and Ayurveda is that they can be practiced in conjunction with or as a complement to Western allopathic medicine. Um, and they also can complement any belief system or lack of belief system. So it, it's really beautiful. No one's asking you to change your beliefs or to, uh, to believe something that isn't real for you. What it does offer is Ayurveda offers another lens through which to view life. Uh, it's kind of as much a philosophy as it is a science. And in Ayurveda, everything in the world, your physical body, your thoughts, your nerve conduction, the earth, animate and inanimate objects, all of nature are considered to be comprised of the five great elements. And that would be earth, water, fire, air or wind, those words are interchangeable, and space. Um, and so through Ayurveda, the goal is to like understand your own makeup, right? You can imagine that if you consider those elements as a continuum, earth is the grossest, like most dense, heavy, solid, stable of the elements, and then all the way on up through air and space, light and clear and subtle. So knowing your own makeup, having some self-awareness, using the tools that we've been speaking about, um, gives you the ability to choose proactively things that are in line with your wellness. Um, and then when you invariably get out of sync, um, Ayurveda offers you tools to get back on track. So for instance, if you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, Ayurveda considers that to be um, excess air, excess movement, excess wind, right? So if that's up here in the subtle range, we need the opposite to balance. So a really main principle of Ayurveda is like increases like and opposites balance. You got too much wind with stress and overwhelm, we're going to increase the earth element. What the heck is she talking about? Earth in terms of foods, you're going to look for foods that are nurturing, and sustaining and building. Maybe that means a warm, healthy stew for lunch instead of a cold, crunchy salad. You might think the salad's good, but that salad is light and crunchy and noisy, and it's everything that you're trying to not be, right? And also activities. You're going to go for activities that are more grounding, meditation, restorative yoga, isometric exercises, like hold a plank, it's really strengthening, grounding, supportive, and warming. But you don't want to be taking a Zumba class. There's nothing wrong with Zumba. But if you're stressed or overwhelmed, you're just adding to the frenzy, right? Um, anything, anything that promotes mindfulness, calm, and ease. That could be reading a book, could be petting a fur baby, knitting, you know, painting, whatever helps you to calm. Those are self-care techniques that... Ayurveda would, would support. Uh, and there's so much to say. Like, like Matt said, if we had eight hours, I could tell you a little bit more. But fortunately, <laughs> I do have a free masterclass that's on a, a wellness website that I have, uh, My Yoga Joy. So if you want to look for more on that, there's a free masterclass there about elemental wellness. 
um, and can give you a little more tips and insights there. That's awesome. We have a couple more minutes and you're going to be walking us through some stuff. Let me ask you one more question. Um, this is all amazing because, right, there's mindset that leads to great mindfulness and being really present, which ultimately is what fuels mental health. If, if someone's feeling burned out, like we've come through, I don't know if you noticed, but we've come through a thing and we're still in it. There's been this little pandemic thing that's been going around the world and a lot of people have been sort of mind, mindset messed up over the past couple of years. Um, if someone's feeling burned out, e either with their life or in dentistry, what tools do yoga and Ayurveda offer? And we'll just go a couple of minutes and then we'll transition to, to uh, something you're actually going to show us. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So burnout is exactly what it says. It's when you've been running your fire too hot, burning that candle at both ends, just too long, working too many hours or too many days, or just not practicing self-care. Right. And so the light in your eyes goes out, the fire in your belly of passion or desire for the things that bring you joy, let's fizzles and you're feeling pretty flat. So sometimes the tendency is, well, dang, I'm just going to drink more coffee and do more stuff and move faster. And I'm going to grab more fast food and I'm going to just not sleep and, uh, you know, run on fumes. Of course, we all know that's ridiculous. It doesn't work. And it leads not only to more burnout, but also to physical and mental illness. So Ayurveda would say, you're a tender baby. When your fire is out, you can't just throw more fuel and oil on it. You've got to kindle it, rekindle it gently. And so that goes back to some of those restorative things I was talking about. Eating nourishing foods, taking mild to moderate exercise. This is not when you're going to train for a marathon. You, you can't, okay? Um, getting enough sleep when you're overwhelmed and when you're burnt out. And so if you had had a heart attack, you'd take it a little bit easy because you have to. So recognizing burnout, practicing mindfulness and awareness and self-care are necessary to recover from burnout as well as to prevent yourself from having a heart attack, right? Um, you know, look at your daily habits. So one thing is just say no, right? You can't overcommit. No, I will not work through my lunch hour. And I'm sorry that the person's having an emergency. It is in my health and interest. I cannot work through another lunch hour today, every day. No, I cannot be on that committee. Um, I will not be on that committee at this time. So saying no. Number two, um, look at your daily habits in your calendar, as you had said earlier today. Are you scheduling time for a lunch break? Are you scheduling time to exercise? Are you scheduling time to reconnect with your friends or your family? Are you scheduling time for whatever restores you? Right? So putting that in the calendar. And then third, again, ask for and accept help. Uh, that definitely can help you to get yourself out of burnout. Um, so just some little shifts, little changes. We're not looking for a seismic California weather kind of changes. We're looking for little shifts that can reap really big rewards in terms of your wellness and well-being. That's pretty fantastic. Uh, it's funny, as you were speaking, you know, I, uh, I've traveled, so I'm out of my time zone. I'm based out of San Francisco. And um, there was a little notification that popped up from one of my fitness devices that said, bedtime's approaching, start to get ready. <laughs> you need to be... We need to be focused on our sleep and use what tools, uh, what tools are available. Um, stopping tolerating the things that that we no longer need to tolerate. Calendaring those things that we that that, that matter. So I will say, Doctor Matt Corn, Matthew Corn, Matt, thank you. I really appreciate your being here. The, the gems that you've offered have been significant. Uh, Roberta Garceau, Roberta, this is going to be amazing. Um, we're going to be learning some easy to do at home and at the office exercises from you at this point. Uh, we can all use this about now. So this is the <laughs> thing that I'm going to invite. I'm going to invite the... Uh, 
the audience to actually go along and, and practice this with you. So um, you're going to uh, just uh, as an audience member, allow yourself to participate as Dr. Garceau, as Roberta brings us a few of her other gifts. And uh, Roberta, you are ready for us? I am so ready. Awesome. <laughs> thank All you. right. So thank you. So welcome to the audience participation portion of this program, right? You are definitely invited to participate. Um, I'm going to be offering three different exercises or experiences that can be practiced individually or separately, as well as they can be in tandem, like I'm, I'm going to offer them today. You will have access in your resource section to written instructions for these exercises so that you or a team member could lead these for your team at the office or at home. Um, as well, I'll have a video version of this presentation available for free at myyogajoy.com. Um, I think that's it. I also have to accompany this, this section some slides of places that are meaningful to me and, and you might like to look at. For those of you who prefer to view this in full screen, you can find the little upward facing arrow at the bottom of your screen that allow, just click on that and that will bring you to a full screen version for this portion. To get out of that, you can just hit the escape button on your keyboard. So that's an option there as well. Okay, um, again, this is intended to be available and safe to just about everybody. That being said, you know yourself the best and you are responsible ultimately for your well-being. So if there's anything that I offer that is not appropriate for you, please modify or just do what you need to do to take care of yourself. All right. Ah, so beginning with guided meditation and centering on the elements. Uh, I invite you to, you can do this from lying down. Please don't do that now. You'll fall asleep uh, from sitting or standing up. If you're standing, you'll want to plant your feet about shoulder width apart, a little wider than your hips, about shoulder width apart and stand nice and tall. If you're sitting on a chair, scooch forward so that you're on the edge of your seat. You don't want to be slumped over. You know, you're not going to breathe like that. So get to the edge of your seat. If you're sitting on the floor as I am, you may want to sit on a block or a pillow or a cushion just to raise your hips above your knees. That allows blood flow through your hips as well as gives you space. Like if you're sitting like this, it's going to be a little hard to breathe. So giving your torso room to expand. Beautiful. All right. <sighs> Exhale. And we begin. Go ahead and bring your hands to your hips with the thumbs facing towards your lower back, fingers wrapped around the front of your hips, and just rock side to side. If you're standing, you can. your feet may be doing this a little bit, rubbing on the edges of the feet. Just begin to open the hips. There's a lot of times stories and things that get stored here or kind of get stuck here. And then come to center and give yourself a little massage with your thumbs in that lower back region. You know, besides the obvious things of, uh, you know, positional things we do with our jobs of leaning over people, lower back pain can indicate stress and anxiety. Those are big places those guys like to hang out. So give yourself a little self-massage. And then again, bring the hands around and begin to rock your hips forward so your tailbone lifts behind you, your belly sways out, and then exhale, lower the tailbone. Rock the hips back and kind of look towards your belly button. Inhale forward, exhale back. So just doing a little rocking again, lubricating the hips, opening things, releasing a little bit, and getting ready to sit. And then find that place that's neither forward nor back, that central place, and leave yourself be there. Bring the hands to the lap, arms by the side. And the invitation is to soften your gaze. Lower your eyes towards the floor. If it's comfortable, you can close your eyes and go inside for a little introspection, a little inward focus. And we'll begin with the earth element. Feel your feet on the floor, your bottom on the seat, stable, supported, grounded. 
Notice the weight of your muscles, heavy, smooth, and soft. Bring your awareness to the water element as tears that lubricate your eyes. Swallow some saliva that moisturizes your mouth. Be mindful of synovial fluid that bathes your joints and allows mobility. And cerebrospinal fluid that nourishes and protects your central nervous system. Now bring your attention to that space just above your belly button. Feel the fire of digestion or indigestion or hunger pangs. Scan your body. Notice any areas that are sharp, or tingling, anything that's throbbing or warm. And as you exhale, just send a gentle breath there to cool it down. Continue to breathe in through your nose if it's available. Feeling the wind element pass through your na na nasal passages into the small spaces of your lungs. With each exhalation, feeling the air move over your top lip, maybe a little warmer for the journey. Continue to breathe here. And notice that as you breathe in, your torso expands into space around you. And as you breathe out, you leave space where you once were. Now just breathe and feel and notice. Notice your heart rate, your breath, the qualities of your mind. Is anything shifted? Is there any more calm or stillness? Maybe there is and maybe there isn't. Now moving into a five second breath. Again, this is intended to be available to just about everybody. If at any time it doesn't feel right for you, just return to your breath exactly as it is right now. So we'll begin together, exhaling completely, squeezing the belly button towards the spine, and then we'll begin, I'll count out loud. Inhale, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, Exhale, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five. Breathe in, two, three, four, five. Breathe out, two, three, four, five. Inhale. Exhale. And in and out. Continue to breathe this way on your own, noticing the rhythmicity of your breath. If there are any edges that feel sharp or rough, see if you can iron them out. Make your breath as smooth and silky as possible. Complete another one or two breath cycles here. And the next time you exhale, just return to your natural breath. Keep that inward focus. And again, check in with yourself. Is there any more ease 
around your eyes or your jaw or your shoulders. How has your breath shifted? Now, if your eyes have been closed, let them gently flutter open. Still keeping things soft. And we'll take this breath into mindful movement. So beginning together, bringing the hands to heart center. Inhale, extend the arms out in front of you, palms facing up, elbows towards each other. Hands are cupped. Exhale, elbows bend, bring the fingertips to the forehead, cup the hands over the eyes. Breathing in, draw the palms together, then the thumbs. Begin to lift the arms up overhead as the backs of the hands come together. Left hand comes to the right wrist, exhale to the left. Inhale, stretch it all the way up towards the ceiling. Tall mountain, switch the clasp of your hands. Exhale, opposite side. Breathing in, reach all the way up, tall mountain. Breathing out, turn to your left, open the arms out to the horizon as you exhale, bringing the right hand to the left hip, left hand behind you in a twist. Breathing in, unwind from the twist, bring the arms front and center up overhead. Turn to the other side, breathe out, open the arms to the horizon, left hand to right hip, right hand behind you as you gaze over your right shoulder. Inhale, unwind from the twist, arms up overhead, fingers interlace. Exhale, finger uh, palms towards the ceiling, round the back, gaze comes towards the belly button, feeling a stretch in the back of your heart. Breathing in, release the fingers, breast stroke it open. Begin to flex your back, arch your back, lift your chest, chin, and gaze as your fingers interlace behind you. Exhale, draw the shoulders down and back. Open the heart, open the collarbones. Breathing in, draw the shoulders up towards the ears, fingers interlace. Breathing out, press the palms down, shoulders release. Take a stretch to either side of the neck. Ooh. One more time. Inhale, extend the arms out in front of you, palms facing up at the horizon. Exhale, elbows bend, bring the fingertips to the forehead, cup the hands over the eyes. Breathing in, palms come together, then the thumbs begin to raise the arms up overhead, backs of the hands together, left hand to right wrist. Exhale, stretch the wrist, armpit, and side ribs all the way over. Beautiful. Inhale, raise it all the way up. Exhale, switch the clasp of your hands. Bring it on over to the opposite side. See if you can feel it down into the hip or side waist. Inhale, draw it all the way up overhead. Exhale, turn to the left, arms open to the horizon, right hand to left hip, left hand behind you in a twist. Breathing in, unwind from the twist, bring it all front and center up overhead. Breathing out, turn the opposite way, arms at the horizon, left hand to right hip, right hand behind you. Inhale, unwind from the twist, arms come up overhead, fingers interlace. Exhale, Flip the palms up, round the back, gaze towards your belly button, feeling the back of the heart open. Breathing in, release the fingers, breaststroke it open, hands interlace behind you as you lift your chest, chin, and gaze. Exhale, draw the shoulders down and back. Breathing in, shrug the shoulders all the way up to the ears, fingers interlace. Breathing out, press the palms down, release the shoulders, stretch one side and then the other of the neck. And just bring your hands to your lap. Go ahead and close the eyes or lower the gaze. Just go inside for a few more moments. And just notice what may have shifted for you. Do you feel a sense of calm perhaps? A little tingling, blood flowing? little energy, maybe more space between your shoulders, more space to breathe. So practices like this are wonderful for self-care, for self-awareness, 
and you can do them for free anytime, any place. Doesn't need any special equipment, right? Self care is not selfish. It's absolutely essential to your well being. And it's necessary for us to be present, aware, and caring of others. So, on that note, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Ronnie Brown. Ronnie is going to be speaking to us to help us understand how what we can do to recognize crisis in others and how we can support one another. Ronnie? Thank you, Roberta. Thank you for that mindfulness exercise. You know, one of the most important things that we can do as dental professionals is to, you know, reflect back on those moments when we knew that we weren't okay and we didn't necessarily know what to say or, you know, what to do. But I think by reflecting back on those moments, it really does help create um, a dialogue. It provides us with an opportunity for us to, you know, learn and grow from those opportunities so that next time one of those moments occurs, we can address it more skillfully as well as more confidently. So with that, I would like to introduce to our panel, Jocelyn Coupel, and I hope I can see her uh, video coming up. But Jocelyn Coupel is a uh, senior trial, a former senior trial prosecutor. She is a domestic violence expert. She's a speaker, she's an educator who delivers innovative and impactful training across the country to address issues of domestic violence. For the past two decades, Jocelyn has prosecuted high-risk domestic violence cases. And her passion for domestic violence, if you will, really was ignited during her first year as a senior trial prosecutor, where in her native country, Canada, it witnessed the worst multiple domestic violence homicide that that country had ever experienced. Unfortunately, earlier this year, one of our own dental colleagues, Serena, who worked for Dr. Bell, lost her life to domestic homicide. Jocelyn had the opportunity to speak to Dr. Bell and his team as they mourned the loss of their teammate, Serena, to domestic violence. Jocelyn will point out um, you know, what she heard and what they share with her in terms of what they saw, what they heard during the final weeks, during the final days of Serena's life. And she'll share those reflections from the team, really from an informed perspective, and will point out the potential significance of those observations. So with that, Jocelyn, it's great to see you and I welcome you to our panel conversation. Oh, thank you, Ronnie, for your very kind introduction. Um, as as you have suggested, and I, I agree, I'm, I'm here today because of Serena, really, um, and because of her story. And it's a story that is a very common story to me. It's a story that I've heard hundreds of times in the course of my career, but it's not so familiar to our audience. Mm -hmm. So before we really um, get into the larger conversation, I want to introduce you a little bit to Serena. Um, she was a long time valued uh, general dental assistant in Dr. Bell's practice, as you as you mentioned. Um, she married her husband, Eric, in January of this year. And six months later, uh, Eric murdered her by strangling mm. her to death. And uh, that occurred when she told him that she was leaving him. So I want the audience to think about that, um, that singular fact. Mm -hmm. In the few months leaving, leading up to her murder, there were a lot of signs that all was not well with her marriage and that Eric was actually pretty obsessive, jealous, controlling man. Uh, Serena never really spelled out exactly what was happening. She, um, but she wasn't completely silent uh, either. There were many signs from which an like from an informed point of view uh, would have um, been recognized or realized to be significant by both Serena herself uh, and uh, by her team members, frankly. So, for example, when her colleagues saw Serena's bruised throat and neck, uh, they knew that something wasn't right. Uh, they asked her about it. 
and asked her what happened. And her reply was, you know, somewhat flippant, according to what I was told, mm -hmm. uh, namely that Eric had, quote, choked her a little bit during sex. So, you know, I mean, that's kind of a hard mm -hmm. thing, you know, to like go on from. So her right. colleagues kind of accepted her excuse, um, as I think most of us would. I mean, mm -hmm. what else are you going to say? And they didn't speak about it further with Serena because she kind of shut the door, at least as far as they were concerned. So, so today my goal is to give a voice to uh, what Serena, and I think all victims of domestic violence want from all of us, uh, from our colleagues, um, uh, from our community, from our friends and from our family. And here's what I think uh, we need to know. Um, mm -hmm. We need to be educated about the dynamics of domestic violence. We need to be able to identify the signs of domestic abuse within you know, the context that we're in. We need to start a conversation. And this is the probably one of the most important points. We need to ask a person what is really happening, what is really going on. We need to be compassionate and we need to be um, without judgment, like you can't, you know, you have to be essentially suspend your judgment um, and just be compassionate. And honestly, we need to make it our business, both individually and collectively, uh, to find out what the resources are in our own communities so that we can provide referrals. So, um, and we're going to talk about that through our conversation today a lot more. But um, before we continue with that conversation, Ronnie, I want our audience to know a little bit more about you. Uh, we've heard some, th some things about you, but um, um, you're, you're too modest to, to tell the audience <laughs> that you are, in fact, a, a renowned um, expert on substance use disorders. Uh, this is an expertise which you, you, you talked about your work over the last two and a half decades. Um, but and that so it's certainly experience born of clinical practice, but also research. And you're also a published author uh, who wrote a, a book called A State of Decay. And that particular book actually walks dental, dental practitioners through recognizing, communicating with, and treating patients who have meth mouth. So, in your context, what can you tell? us about your reaction to seeing a colleague with bruising to her neck area. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn. You know, um, quite honestly, I probably would um, be uncomfortable. You know, I uh, would probably go through, um, I think in my head, I would probably go through, you know, what could this be? Um, I'd ask myself, you know, was, could this be the result of an accident? Uh, could this reflect some type of medical condition, maybe a vascular issue? And then, of course, I would uh, play on my head, could this be the signs of some type of abuse? I probably would put into my head what I kind of knew about my colleagues' personal relationships, even see if I could maybe figure out who the abuser might be. Um, and then, Jocelyn, I think I probably would try to figure out, you know, how do I start the conversation? Um, right. And that would be uncomfortable. And probably, you know, honestly, in the back of my head, I would ask myself, is this even my business? Um, and that just might be the default so that um, I wouldn't ask the question. <laughs> but Jocelyn, let me ask you, um, if you don't mind, like something very similar, what would you do? You know, you heard my story. What would you do if you walked into your uh, place of employment and you saw your employer laying on the ground strapped to a nitrous tank. Would you know what to say? Would you know what to do? <laughs> well, I, I want to preface my response to that question by saying um, I have in my in the course of my um, two and a half decades of working uh, in the prosecute as a prosecutor, as a DA and uh, with defense counsel um, uh, on the other side of the table uh, that I've suspected colleagues, I've suspected lawyers that I work with of having a substance use disorder, but I never 
sought to ask them about it. It was just not something that I felt comfortable mm -hmm. about. Um, and I, I have to say, in the legal profession, there's a very high rate of substance use disorder. So mm -hmm. to respond more directly to your question, I would have to say um, I would be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, I would be shocked. I mean, maybe I wouldn't be surprised that something had happened if I happened to know that, you know, that the person was having issues with alcohol or drugs. Uh, but um, I, I'd probably turn around and be truthful. I'd turn around and walk away um, so I could collect myself a bit and think about what I should or maybe more pertinently could do. <laughs> and truly, uh, if the circumstances were right, I might just pretend not that I didn't see it because it would just be so overwhelming you know, from my perspective to, um, especially in an employer employee type of situation. So well, I think that's why we're, you know, having this kind of dialogue, this conversation one, it hopefully will help the audience know that our reaction or response might not be that different from their reaction or response, but really so that we can bring this issue of substance use and domestic violence to the forefront of conversations. And we can start learning to know what the signs look, are and how to interpret those signs and also to hopefully be able to talk through um, resources for both safety and treatment for uh, people that we are going to encounter in our life who do have a substance use disorder or are subjected to domestic violence. So before we kind of delve into um, the depth of our conversation, Jocelyn, could you just start off with maybe a definition of domestic violence so we make sure that we're all kind of on the same page and understanding it? Yes, yes, fair comment. So okay. um, I, I first want to just let everyone know, uh, you know, that you have already heard and will continue to hear the term intimate partner violence uh, or IPV, which I may refer to it as, but also interchangeably, you'll, you're you going to hear the term domestic violence as you've just um, used. And, and that's actually a pretty common, um, more common definition. You know, people have a better understanding of domestic violence and, and they kind of appreciate what that is. So uh, let's talk about what IPV is. Okay. Um, it, <laughs> violence uh, by an intimate partner is manifested by physical uh, sexual, um, uh, emotionally abusive acts, as well as controlling behavior. And that's, that's a very significant thing in the context of um, IPV because different from stranger violence. In stranger violence or violence with a friend or in a bar, um, it's not about control. It's, it's just about the violence. So that's mm -hmm. a, a very big difference. Uh, the violence can also take forms which maybe the average person may not consider to be violence, but things like financial and spiritual abuse, um, um, taking a passport away uh, so that a person has no freedom of, of mobility, isolating from friends and family. Uh, the forms may differ, but ultimately, as I've mentioned, uh, the um, objective of the abuser is the same, and that is control. So, um, and I have to say, uh, from in utero to throughout childhood, children are profoundly and very often ir irrevocably damaged by IPV. Mm. And uh, if the audience uh, can see the slide, you know, there's some of the, you know, headlines about this research. But um, so that, that kind of is a brief definition of, of what we're looking at with IPV. Ronnie, can you on your side uh, tell us um, a little bit more about what substance use disorder is, uh, you know, from your expertise? Yeah, substance use disorder, Jocelyn, is a disorder in which someone, you know, quite simply is using a drug in a way that's inappropriate, which means they're using the drug in a way it was really never intended to be used. They're using the drug, um, you know, excessively, both in frequency and in quantity, and they're also using that drug dangerously, you know, um, because when they drink that drink or they pop that pill, they're, you know, putting their lives at risk. But in order for someone to be diagnosed with a substance use disorder, they have to meet at least two out of 11 criteria established by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And just 
really quickly, those criteria include if someone's using a drug in a situation that's dangerous or harmful. You know, they're having that drink and then they're getting behind the wheel of a car. They're right. using the drug even though they are starting to experience a decline in their physical and mental health. They're using the drug even though it's worsening the relationship that they have with their friends and their family. They're using the drug even though it's making it difficult for them to meet obligations in their life. And the use of the drug is kind of worsening or escalating a legal situation. But also the use of the drug has become a problem. I think, you know, Matt had uh, really well articulated that because um, the individual has started to develop a tolerance to the drug. It takes more and more of the drug to experience its pleasurable effects. When the drug's mm -hmm. not in the system, the individual will experience withdrawal. And the individual has begun to use more of the drug than they had ever accepted for a longer period of time than they had ever anticipated. And now they're having difficulty not using the drug. So that's really kind of in a nutshell, um, the things that need to be kind of looked at in terms of kind of the diagnostic, as well as just kind of a basic definition of a substance use disorder. So Jocelyn, how many, um, you know, based upon what you know, how many um, how many people are affected by domestic violence, intimate partner violence? Uh, well, <laughs> that it's pretty staggering, actually. Um, I, I'm going to make this statement, which is, um, uh, you know, which is um, verified by both the World Health Organization and UNICEF, namely that domestic violence is a global issue. Um, it's an they call it an international epidemic is mm. how the World Health Organization and UNICEF define the uh, issue. And uh, the loss of life annually, just to get a little bit of a sense comparatively, uh, exceeds the loss of life from the COVID pandemic, pandemic like Crazy. every month, every day, every week, every year. Um, so the statistics suggest that approximately one third of all women are victims of domestic violence during their lifetime. And really, that translates uh, to, you know, that every three women that you and I know, uh, mm -hmm. whether, you, you know, it's a sister or a mom or a friend or a colleague or somebody, a team member in your dental office, one of them has been a victim of IPD. And, um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, really is a huge um, issue. And COVID... Uh, COVID has increased isolation, has increased the ability of uh, the abuser to isolate the individual in the home. Um, unemployment is, is higher. Uh, so there's a lot of more stress that's in the family. And so where you have domestic abuse anyways uh, in the family situation, uh, with COVID, it's become a more prevalent uh, I think that I think the number is something like 8.1 percent higher uh, wow. during COVID than uh, than previously. So, and and that's been described uh, in the media as an epidemic within an epidemic. Um, I know that you know uh, the statistics are pretty scary as well with SUD. Can you tell us a little bit more about those yeah. statistics? Yeah. So, you know, with, um, you know, what's been uh, kind of hypothesized and analyzed is that there's about 23.5 million Americans with a substance use disorder. And as you kind of narrow down those statistics, Jocelyn, 23.5 million means that it's roughly one out of every 10 Americans, which means that roughly one out of every 10 dental professionals, right, has a substance use disorder. So those um, you know, results are definitely staggering, but also the impact that COVID has played, the lack of isolation, the increase in stress, uh, job insecurity, housing insecurity, all of these environmental stressors have really escalated it from already an epidemic level to one that is just definitely more heightened and more uh, intense for so many Americans. Wow. <laughs> Um, there's, a, I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions around, um, I think, both SUD and IPV. So I, I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about 
Well, can you tell us a little bit about the misconceptions, first of all, with respect to SUD? And then, you know, and then maybe I can, yeah. I can do the same. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a lot of misconceptions. And I'll just kind of um, hone in on three. Um, I think the first misconception, you know, if we go is, is it's just um, a behavior choice, you know, and if we go back to kind of that diagnostic, um, you know, the diagnostic criteria, right. Um, you know, using a drug in a harmful situation. So some of my interpret that Jocelyn is, wow, that's just a bad choice someone made or using more of a drug than one had um, intended or for a longer period of time than one had expected, one might interpret that as, wow, that person just has a lack of willpower, a lack of self-control. But addiction is not a behavior, it's actually a disease. And it's been long recognized as a disease since I think 1956 by the American Medical Association. Um, it's defined as a chronic relapsing progressive brain disorder that causes significant changes to the brain, changes to the limbic system, changes in our in one's ability to uh, regulate uh, pleasure and stress and self-control. And mm -hmm. with other diseases, it has a genetic component, a biologic component, an environmental component. When left untreated, it creates that degree of uh, disability and dysfunction. And then if left untreated like other diseases, it actually leads to death. And... In 2019, there were more than 200,000 Americans, Jocelyn, who lost their lives from an unintentional drug overdose death. Now, that's a staggering statistic, right? But it's a yeah. pre-pandemic statistic. So, yes. you know, similar to what you had alluded to um, in 2020, March, the global pandemic collided with our nation's epidemic of addiction. And by the end of 2020, there was a 29% increase in drug overdose deaths in this country. And that's like the single greatest increase in drug overdose deaths ever recorded in this country. So the first misconception is this is just a behavior. It's not, it's a disease. The second misconception is who does this impact? And addiction is indiscriminate. It um, doesn't uh, just pick out a certain socioeconomic class or certain uh, race or whatever it impacts um, all boundaries that we have in society. You know, people who have, are, are wealthy have substance use disorders as well as people who are not, people who are educated, people who are not educated. I think we have in our mind who that person is. You know, that is that person under the bridge or it's the person, people that I treat at the jail, but it's in all sectors of our society and it's in our practice, it's in our population, it's in our profession. So that's the second misconception of who it impacts. The third misconception is, you know, it's super easy to treat. You know, someone can just stop at any time. And the reality is, is that addiction is something that really takes a stronghold on, 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 on brain and self-control and, and pleasure. And um, people oftentimes have to go through many cycles of recovery and relapse before they can experience long-term sobriety. So I would say those would be the the misconceptions that I would want um, those listening to know. But Jocelyn, um, can you piggyback on that and just kind of share kind of with us and with me, what are the misconceptions around intimate partner violence? Well, similar similar to what you've just talked about, actually there's, you know, there's a lot of intersections in terms of the misconceptions. Um, and I know you probably only touched on a few and I'm going to do the same. I'm really going to try and focus on the top three misconceptions that in my mind uh, are important to get people to start thinking about. Um, and uh, the first is that domestic violence is a private family matter. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not. I mean, you know, the very uh, simple answer to that is it's everyone's business and it's everyone's business. Uh, because of the prevalence, because of the impact on the world, because the impact on our children, the impact on our economy. Uh, I mean, it's it's absolutely costing billions in the United States alone, um, uh, the impact of, of violence. Um, whether it be, you know, hospital visits or children who uh, now require um, special assistance because their brains were compromised in utero mm -hmm. and the like. So keeping violence secret doesn't help anybody. 
and it isn't uh, a family matter. Um, it's bad. This is the other concept, and you've already touched on that with the SUD, so I, I won't belabor it. Uh, the idea that, yeah, it's bad, you know, but it, it happens to someone else. It's that right. whole, not in my backyard, it's not in my culture, not in my um, socioeconomic situation, not in my church, um, and so on. So you've already talked about that, but uh, what I um, what I do want to say is I personally in my career have um, prosecuted a judge in one case. I've prosecuted a politician. I've prosecuted police officers. I've prosecuted a homeless street person. Uh, I've prosecuted the wealthy, as you you know alluded to. It's, it's not a problem that's confined to the poor. And I've prosecuted as young as a 14-year-old um, up to an 80-year-old, I think was sort of the outside limit. I've left the biggest misconception to my last point, and uh, namely this idea that it's easy for a victim to leave an abuser. Mm -hmm. And there should be a slide up at this point, but uh, which is kind of an in-your-face uh, reminder that um, this concept that uh, if it were me that was in that situation, I would leave, I would never allow someone to hit me, um, is bogus <laughs> you know i mean we can't get into all of the dynamics and all of the reasons why uh, people end up remaining in or returning to abusive relationships but it's a bogus idea that if you were in that situation you would just be able to walk away and i'll tell you this the most dangerous time for a victim is when they attempt to leave the relationship or when the abuser discovers that they plan to leave so you know, Serena, that's exactly what happened to Serena. She told her abusive husband that she was leaving and he strangled her to death um, uh, in that moment almost. So um, so those, those are some of the misconceptions, I think, that are really important for audience to, um, to think about. Yeah. Thank you for... for you know, kind of opening up all of our eyes, my eyes about, um, you know, the misconceptions, because we all we all harbor them. You know, so Jocelyn, you know, this is difficult, you know, this is, you know, it's difficult, yeah. you know, uh, being in that situation and, and trying to figure out what to say or what to do, not wanting to ignore why, why is this so difficult? Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, I know from speaking with you in preparation for today uh, that, you know, that talking about IPV or SUD is difficult for many of the same reasons. And some of those reasons are a lack of formal training. Like we just don't get any, I mean, even in high schools, you know, where, where really, in my opinion, they should be talking about dating relationships and about good relationships, behavior and that, because they don't, right? It doesn't happen. So there's that lack of education, much less, um, uh, you know, much less in a work setting, like the, the work setting we're talking about, like it's almost right. non-existent. Uh, there's a limited knowledge of um, the issues or even, you know, what it is that, you know, understanding what, what are we looking at? What are we seeing when Serena, you know, jokingly laughs off something which, um, an injury to the throat or um, even if even if it were consensual rough sex uh, is dangerous conduct right um, we don't know what to say we're you know we don't want to offend right we are embarrassed um, it's hard to find the right time you know to talk to somebody especially in a work um, relationship or a work situation um, who do I refer to like you know I'm not a counselor like who do I refer to and, you know, and you you said this uh, before or early in our conversation, not my business, right? Just not my business. So I'm going to ask you to, you know, I know there are a lot of similarities. I may have missed some, though, in terms of SUD. Can you add any other observations through your lens? Well, I think you pretty much highlighted. I think they're very similar. You know, lack of education. Most 
dental schools, most dental hygiene schools devote, I don't know, less than 10 hours in over a four-year period of time on kind of pre-doctoral education around chemical dependency, substance use disorders. So the typical hygienist, dentist graduating from dental school, like I did <laughs> that October day, don't really know what to do or what to say. Um, we are have that fear of offending. And I think we also think that we have to fix this problem. So as a result, you know, Jocelyn, um, when we are confronted with those moments, we're silent. We see the signs, but we're, we're silent. And that silence perpetuates the isolation for the individual who is subjected to domestic violence or the individual who is suffering with a substance use disorder. It does, and it further, I think, stigmatizes um, our own idea of, of who these people are. So the silence actually is probably one of the worst things that we can do. So we have to figure out kind of what to say and um, what to do, but I think we also need to know what to look out for, right? So what would be some of the signs um, that we need to really look out for from that informed perspective so we can interpret and know what they are? Okay, well, I'm going to start uh, again, now, not to bore everybody, but with a couple more statistics. Um, dom uh, domestic violence uh, death review committees have been operating in the Western world for probably 25 years. And uh, they have determined that it's 75% of all domestic homicides that they have actually examined in a very detailed, in-depth way, um, seven or more risk factors were present in those cases. And uh, on, on the slide, hopefully our audience is looking at, I've set out a non-exhaustive list of uh, the major risk factors identified by those death review committees. And I want you to keep an eye on it. I want our audience to sort of keep an eye on that slide as I share with you what I learned um, about Serena, because I want to return to her because she's you know, my purpose for being here. Um, so what did I learn about her from her colleagues and from Dr. Bell and why from an informed point of view, uh, one could readily have concluded she was in an abusive and actually very dangerous relationship. So, um, turning you know, turning a to a little bit more of the facts, um, after her sudden marriage to Eric, her husband, in January, she stopped being this incredibly positive person uh, that her colleagues uh, described. Uh, you know, it was just like super outgoing, super you know, like bigger than life kind of individual. Mm -hmm very positive. She stopped talking about her life and her children, which, you know, like she, I mean, she adored her, her three kids. And she stopped going for drinks outside of work. She stopped engaging in any really extra curricular activities with um, her colleagues, which she had been, you know, quite close to. Um, she went from being capable and confident, uh, larger than life, to someone who didn't really... Um, engage and even when there was an opportunity for, perhaps for her to go out but her husband Eric uh, because he was back and forth at this time between California and his home state and so they were kind of in transition in their marriage and when she'd be invited she would say I, I don't think I can go because Eric will be jealous like he'll be very upset and I don't feel comfortable about that she resigned from her job um, she said she was moving to Pennsylvania to be with Eric and, uh, she expressed concerns about her littlest boy, like her older children, like were pretty independent and it was not a huge, you know, thing for her to disconnect from them, at least physically, geographically, but her youngest one was only six years old and, mm -hmm. uh, Ari, um, would, it, it, she, if, if she was going to join Eric, she was probably going to have to leave her youngest son with his bio dad, who was a great dad, like there was no issue with that, but she was pretty concerned and obviously distressed about that. Um, she didn't speak of Eric in loving terms. Um, she hadn't even told her colleagues that she married him until right. after the fact, if you can imagine. Um, and then she came to work with the injuries that I've described uh, to her throat and neck area, where she kind of, she was asked about, it because I, I think her colleagues were pretty clear that it was pretty bad injury and um 
you know, she blew it off. Uh, and then a week before her murder, she told a colleague that she was breaking up with her and that she was mm-hmm. dreading doing it, that she was scared. And But she was a woman of integrity, I'd say, and she did not want to do it by phone or text, so she traveled to Pennsylvania to tell him. And finally, um, um, uh, you know, I well, I guess so finally, what does this all mean, right? I mean, in the you know, in terms of what I see um, from an informed perspective, and what I see is uh, highlighted in red on the slide that the audience is um, looking at. Um, from, from my conversations alone, not knowing anything more about her or knowing what she actually would have known about her, there were 10 known risk factors um, or signs that Serena was in a potentially lethal situation with her partner. And indeed, you know, that was borne out. So, um, so, so that's really, you know, the perspective that I think we need to uh, have is to be educated um, about what we're looking at. So, Ronnie, can you talk a bit more about the signs, the warning signs for SUD? I mean, you've talked a little bit about it, but I'd like to uh, our audience to hear a bit more about it. So, you know, I think it's, um, and I appreciate you sharing that because it allows us to really start looking for these signs um, with the individuals that we work with and and live with and are friends with. In terms of a substance use disorder, you know, definitely there's going to be some physical changes. You know, it um, could be uh, excessive weight loss that can't be easily explained, you know, through diet or exercise. It could be um, kind of a disheveled appearance, um, lack of personal hygiene all of a sudden. Um, a chronic fatigue appearance. In terms of behavior, you know, um, someone who, as kind of described with Serena, who was kind of bubbly and confident, all of a sudden becomes very uh, withdrawn or easily agitated or um, irritated. Um, They may disappear for periods of time, you know, spending excessive amounts of time uh, in the bathroom or just they're they're missing, uh, don't know where they are. Um, Physically, you might uh, detect an odor. So, you know, we know what the smell of alcohol smells on someone's breath. Uh, a vinegary smell is very indicative sometimes of heroin use, a uh, very ammonia-like smell, very common with methamphetamine use. So that might also have a kind of odd presentation or odor. And then socially, um, all of a sudden their, their friend group has changed. Um, they've disconnected with long-term friends, long-term family, and they kind of have a new crew, which is so different from who that person is. Um, um, their behavior is risky. They're frequently intoxicated when they're out um, in public gatherings. So that would just be a very quick uh, synopsis. Of course, yeah. the manifestations will be dependent upon the substance being abused, but that's just kind of a very quick, um, I would say, summary. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So what does the conversation look like? You know, when we do suspect. Well, <laughs> uh, I, First of all, I got to say, there's no special way to have a conversation, whether it be with a colleague or an employee or uh, a friend. There isn't a special way. I think the most important thing is to be kind, to be compassionate. Um, and so, again, I want to turn back to Serena, like in terms of the conversations that I had with her colleagues and with Dr. Bell. And... Um, thinking about what was present in terms of, from an informed point of view, in terms of signs of abuse. So uh, a conversation with Serena. So let's say, you know, her colleagues say, wow, you know, what happened in relation to her neck and the bruising on her neck and throat? Um, and she and she made the same response. But it was like, you know, I got choked a little bit during sex. At that point, Instead of just letting it go, um, you might say something like, you know, when I see an injury like that, that makes me really scared for your safety because, um, you know, being choked is is something that is really dangerous and very significant. So, um, you know, I've noticed other things really that concern me. Um, I'm worried about you. You know, I'm worried about... Uh, I'm worried about you when you tell me that you're afraid and scared and dreading, you know, talking 
to Eric uh, about breaking up with him. Let's talk about that. So I, I think uh, really it's it's kind of reframing in a way mm -hmm. how we communicate with each other. Um, making some, I think, assertive statements rather than a uh, question. You know, so mm -hmm. instead of saying what happens, say when I see something like that, this is what it tells me. Mm -hmm. It tells me that you're being hurt because, and I mean, she, nobody's going to disagree with that. I got to tell you from my experience with victims, they're not going to disagree with that statement. And it opens the door a little bit, right, to let them know that you're concerned. So I think it's not easy to spot. Like, you know, this is not going to get us there in terms of being able to spot all the signs and so on. It's really hard to talk about. Um but we can, right? We, we can yeah. talk about it. We can ask questions. We can offer support. Um, you can find a way to reach out, like find a space, find a time to reach out. And um, the most important thing is to ask, ask, ask. Like just ask. And then if you do get an answer, even if you get a denial, just go on to validate. Just say, look, you know, I don't know if you're being hurt. But it's okay. It's not your fault. Um, and then the important thing, and I think you're going to talk a little bit about this, is to refer. Okay, you're not a counselor. You're not a therapist. You're not, you know. So you're going to refer. And uh, I would just conclude uh, by saying, at least from my perspective, you know, really everyone can spot the signs if you look for them, if you become educated about them, and if you do see. Uh, the signs, then, you know, reach out, right? And just ask, are you okay? So, Ronnie, um, can you give us some other ideas about how we can have a conversation with someone who you think is suffering from substance use disorder? I, I, mean, how can we help? I, I think it's similar. You know, I, yeah. I think it's similar. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's approaching it with a degree of curiosity. You know, um, curiosity be out of concern and compassion, you know, is, is asking the question, sometimes framing it with, I'm really concerned about you. I'm, I'm really worried. Um, I appreciate what Matt had said, you know, do you need help? Yeah. You know, asking that question, yeah. um, how yeah. can I help you? But I think it's important, you know, for, first and foremost, Jocelyn, there's no script. You know, you walk into a situation, uh, you're not gonna have that script running through your head. You, it's not gonna be perfect, but letting someone know that they're being seen and they're being heard and that you see them and that you hear them makes the difference. It may not be a one and done. It may be multiple conversations, but that first conversation that you have opens the door. But I also feel and in, in talking to um, you know, our colleagues is that oftentimes we don't ask because we're not really clear about our role. We think that if we ask somehow it's our responsibility to fix the situation. And you know, Jocelyn, I'm not um, a domestic violence counselor. Um, I'm not a substance use counselor, you know, I, so my job though, um, is to refer and that's yes. really my role. And so I want people to know that in these conversations, you're not having a conversation because now you're, you're taking the onus of it. You're having to solve this. You're taking it just like, you know, uh, I, I can't do that molar root canal. I'm going to refer to an endodontist. I can't do that, uh, bone graft. I'm refer to a periodontist, but to have, resources. And I'm hoping that um, all of the audience can see the resource page that we have put up there, which lists um, resources that you can have in your office, whether it's for your staff members, whether it's for your patients, or even if it's for yourself, to be able to know where to go, who to refer to. And those resources do exist. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ronnie. So, so, so very true. Um, it really is critical to get educated about the resources available in your own community, in your own backyard. Um, now, I heard your story at the beginning. Actually, that was um, in spite of all the times that we, we've spent uh, chatting, I had not heard that story in the context that you gave it. Um, so can you share with us, like, how, how did this all end? Because <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah, so... Jocelyn, um, you know, that was 1992. About 15 years later, about 15 years ago, um, you know, I was at 
like a really large professional meeting. And I remember that it was lunchtime. I think I was in the buffet line, you know, waiting to get my food. And I felt a tap on my shoulder. And when I turned around, there was Dr. T. Oh my and my gosh. heart started to pound. Because <laughs> Jocelyn, I had not seen Dr. T since that wow. October day in 1992. And I think probably... You can figure out, but I never got my Monday start in this practice. But there we were at this <laughs> professional wow. meeting after so much time and kind of with so much things unresolved between us. And, you know, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. But when I looked at him, I saw the man, Jocelyn, that I had so admired. I saw the man mm -hmm. that I had respected. And then he took one step towards me. He put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, thank you, Ronnie. Oh. And I knew at that moment that the steps that I had taken that day had been the right steps, not just for Dr. T, but they had been the right steps for me. Because Jocelyn, when I went home that October day, I remember, and I don't remember how I remember, but I remember seeing something in the back of a CDA journal that talked about a wellness program for impaired dentists. I never huh. imagined that I'd be calling as that young dentist who had completed a residency, who you know just was starting her career, that now I'd be making that phone call. But when I made that call, and it was one of the most difficult uh, calls to make, on the other mm -hmm. end of the line was a dentist who was very compassionate, who reassured me that I had made the right decision, who listened to what I shared with him, what I had seen when I walked into the office who verified that this was a dentist who was indeed in need of help. I was reassured that the call would be confidential. I was reassured that they had systems in place to help him find a path to recovery. And so I don't think it was Matt who picked up the phone, but I would like to invite Matt to come back um, onto the call because I'm sure he provides that degree of reassurance, that degree of expertise to so many uh, individuals um, who make that call and then are connected to him. So, Matt, can you come back and uh, talk a little bit about the well-being program? I sure can. Wow, thank you, Ronnie and Jocelyn. That is just powerful information, uh, and it really reminds me that there is uh, very often not one thing happening. There can be multiple things happening simultaneously. There can be substance abuse disorder, violence, and there can be mental health issues on top of that. So uh, what does it look like? I was not the guy that Ronnie called, by the way. That was my predecessor. And it, I want to take a few minutes to sort of lead up to how we got to where we are today as a committee. 1984, Dr. Gail Kleffler was an oral surgeon from San Diego who uh, self-referred uh, himself to a treatment facility uh, and was able to get help for his alcoholism. Part of what we do once we get sober is we do our best to help others because that helps us stay sober. Uh, Ronnie talked about the relapse potential uh, in substance abuse disorders. This is how we take care of ourselves by passing it on. So uh, Dr. Kleffler understood that if you're a dentist and you're getting in trouble with drugs or alcohol, you're gonna to go to the board. That's a law enforcement entity and they tend to take law enforcement punitive approaches to treating addiction and alcoholism. So basically what he did is formed a committee that had a sort of handshake agreement with the dental board where the dental board would take care of criminal activity and the wellness committee, which was the well-being committee in those days, would steer people toward treatment and uh, recovery for their substance abuse disorders. So things changed in 2008 when the state legislature decided that it would, they would no longer allow the state board to do any kind of recovery. And that's when this committee sort of put it into high gear to create a, a formal program for dentists that are struggling with substance abuse disorders. So, up to today, uh, with the, actually just prior to COVID, we became aware that uh, medicine and dentistry was just behind with starting to struggle with burnout. 
and the associated effects of that, the main one being suicide. Um, so we decided to branch out and start to include resources, referrals for uh, resources not related to substance abuse disorders. So that's why this information today is, is really bringing this all together into one package. So the bottom line is that um, the dental board is very public, very punitive. They are a law, law enforcement uh, entity. We knew that, that uh, to treat dentists who might be struggling with, with substance abuse disorders, we had to be 100% private and 100% confidential. In the Haiti, there were 150 dentists in each of the boards program and the well-being program. And um, by the way, that was back in the days of the three martini lunches. I remember those were happening when I first came to town. It was kind of surprising, uh, even for a guy like me that wasn't into recovery yet. But uh, today there are 15 people in the diversion program and 10 in the wellness program. So we are not reaching people anymore. So we're reaching out in these new ways to try to make ourselves available to our members. Um, Ronnie went through some statistics on the prevalence of substance abuse disorders. Let me bring it home to our membership, CDA Dentists. Right now, there are about 30,000 dentists in uh, California. This is an equal opportunity destroyer, the disease of addiction. And if you use a conservative number, and I'm gonna use 15%, it may be closer to 10%, but let's just use 15. That means that there's 4,500 dentists in California right now who are eligible uh, to really be under uh, having treatment and monitoring to help them into recovery. And we have 25. So we're, we're not reaching people and we're uh, taking certain actions to reach out to uh, executive directors of the dental components, dental society components. So anybody who thinks they may have a, a problem or know a dentist with a problem or a dental team member with a problem can call their local dental society or uh, you can call the numbers that should be on the screen by now. But uh, bottom line is that the drop-off in participation is connected to the isolation that's going on with COVID. And um, we're here to reach out to ask people to um, pick up the heaviest phone you've ever picked up in your life. If you know somebody that's struggling, everything will be confidential and uh, we are here to help. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all the uh, the uh, attributes that dentists and dental team members tend to display. Ronnie did an excellent job of that. The one thing I did want to mention is that the one thing that seems to not suffer is the quality of the dentistry. So don't think you can look into somebody's mouth and notice that a crown margin is off a little bit and that's the way you'll figure it out. We seem to have a lot of training and a lot of excess capacity. We still end up doing our dentistry well even when we're struggling. So um, that's, that's most of what I have to offer. Again, the numbers are up on the um, screen. Uh, those, by the way, are the cell phone numbers of different dentists in different parts of the state by region. I don't know if the, um, if the uh, regions are up there, but yeah, they are. So if you see a region there, that's the number to call. It doesn't matter who you talk to, but just understand that A, person making the report will be uh, protected. The dentist will, uh, will most likely grab a, a fellow member. We're gonna go meet with the dentist. That'll be organized by the person that calls. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna tell our stories and about the miracles that we've become. And since we're not experts in the treatment or identification of the disease, we're simply going to invite the dentist or the concerned entity to be assessed by professionals. That's their only commitment is to, um, is to surrender to the examination and diagnostic process that's performed usually at a treatment center. And if it turns out that there isn't anything going on, they report back to us and they um, give us recommendations. Uh, if it is a substance use disorder, the dentist or the concerned individual will go off to a treatment facility, be treated, and then we will be supplied with what we call aftercare, 
uh, instructions that we then help supervise and implement. So that's that's sort of the, the nature of our program. Uh, we do work with a case manager who monitors people daily to make sure they're not using, using drugs, uh, and they typically supervise them through a a facilitated group process where they meet with them on occasion to see if see how things are going and give them support. Um, basically, uh, we are there to facilitate that whole process. Being dentists and not experts, uh, we're, uh, we are uh, in recovery ourselves as we just offer that camaraderie. So uh, that's, that's basically the program in a nutshell. And uh, again, the new part of our program is to partner with people for things like suicide prevention, uh, IPV, as you've learned here today, and so forth. So uh, we're becoming a full service committee. So that's about it. And with that summary complete, what I'd like to do is welcome back Dr. P. Hope you're still there and uh, you can take us Thank home. You. Thank you, Matt. Amazing. Um, you know, in my history in running a hospital-based program, I also uh, ran a diversion program, uh, and it's for it was for professionals, and we saw all kinds of professionals, and some of whom you'd think it was scary to think they needed it or scary for them to step forward. You know, pilots, for example. Um, and the fact that it's there, the fact that the resources are there, it's so important. So what an incredible few hours we've had. <laughs> I mean, this has been truly, truly so amazing. The CDA to put this together, um, I'm appreciative, I'm inspired, I'm in awe. Uh, some of this has been inspirational, some of it has been scary, uh, and all of it, all of it leads us back to hope, to hope. Remember to start with mindset and to pull out the magic formula, mindset, accountability, gratitude, inspiration, and clarity. Focus back on what you learned about mental health in general, how it shows up, what it looks like. Substance use disorders, SUD, the acronym you heard, uh, start to be curious, start to look at issues of domestic violence or IPV, and do not let stigma be the thing that stops anyone, not you and not those you know from getting the support they need. It's up to each of us to have that conversation so that we can overcome stigma, which is really a killer. Remember that self-care, this is uh, uh, about you. Self-care is where you start. Think about what you can do for yourself and how you can integrate some of the exercises you learned today. How can you integrate those into your daily routine? Remember that when we get triggered by something, it's because it pushes on our identity, right? It could be something that someone says or something that someone does. If you're offended or feeling blamed or shamed, it's okay to say something. And remember that the thing that's triggering you is probably more about the other person than it is about you. So take some time tonight to reflect on your triggers. If you're feeling like you have to go or do something because there's this thing boiling up inside of you, it's good to know what they are. The key here is in identifying what your personal triggers are and having a response ready before it happens. What are you going to do the next time you find yourself overwhelmed, frustrated, or angry? What's your plan? And plan is the key here. So will it be that you're reaching out to someone or taking yourself out of the environment for a little while? Will it be seeking a more creative outlet, journaling, or playing music? I'm going to suggest you have language and a script ready to go. Reflect on your triggers and have a plan. The script could be something like, I have a different opinion, and I choose not to be in this conversation right now. That's especially important around the holidays. 
Um, there's all kinds of triggers coming up. So reflect on your triggers and develop a plan for yourself. Um, don't just let tonight be a, a bunch of good ideas. They are a bunch of good ideas, but don't let it stop there. How will you extend your plan or create a new one specifically so that it reaches your team and beyond? How would you build a culture of caring in your practice? That starts with your vision. It starts with your values. And you, when you align your vision with your values and turn that into action, and you ask how people are doing, and you ask in an interview for people to describe things that aren't potentially a normal interview, as, as long as that's not part of a, an interview, uh, make it or break it kind of question, ask the new hires as part of bringing them on board. One thing uh, that we heard today that will help you to lead your team in daily or uh, is to lead your team in daily or weekly mindfulness exercises. Like have a plan for doing that, bring your team together. And if you're not comfortable doing that yourself, certainly there may be somebody on your team that is, or you could bring in outside experts. Taking just a few minutes to allow space for mental wellness for your team will bring a space of calm and peace. We all felt that. Uh, I know <laughs> whether you participated in, in Dr. Garceau's exercises or just watched and felt the, <laughs> the vibe flowing through the screen, we all felt more calm and more peace. And doing that together does build a beautiful and trusting culture. Jocelyn and Ronnie spoke about compiling and making resources easy for your team to access in your practice. Now, we will make those resources available to you after the session and some of the resources, uh, the other resources that our speakers talked about today will be on the CDA website and available for download. Some of the resources are directly on the speakers' websites. Roberta talked about accessing hers. I have a free masterclass on presence that you can access and you can download one of my uh, number one best-selling books as well. So be sure to reach out to each of the speakers independently as well. Um, you will also be able to access this recording after the event. I'm happy to be able to tell you that. And remember that one of the most important resources that you heard about today is the CDA Wellness Committee. Matt and his committee are here for you. So I'd like to leave you with one final challenge, and that is to create a culture of caring in your practice. It might look different for each of you. And talking about wellness, providing access to resources, and simply making space for discussion will, will all lead to a healthier dental team, a healthier practice, and that's for you and your patients. Truly, we hope that the the last three hours have been impactful and meaningful for you. And honestly, this is just the beginning of a very, very important conversation. Please use the tools and experience you learned tonight to help you recognize, manage, and talk about your own mental health and that of your team members and your coworkers. It's critical we engage discussion, reduce the stigma of mental illness, and move mental health and wellness to the forefront of the conversation. On behalf of my fellow speakers, I will end where I started, and that is to say thank you. Thank you for being part of this very, very important conversation. Stay well. Good night.